Before we delve into who the two witnesses in the book of Revelation are and what they do, we should first consider what kind of person is meant to understand this cryptic book. Is it written for scholars, Hebrew or Greek experts? Or perhaps understanding its wisdom is reserved for some secret fraternity with special handshakes? Wouldn't it be unfair if only those who could speak Greek, for example, could understand the book? Our proposition is that God is indeed a fair God, and much of the symbolism in this book is based on the same symbols found in nature, embedded throughout creation. These symbols are observable to all people, both bond and free, rich and poor. Let's turn our attention to scripture. When people think about the prophecy of the two witnesses, they usually focus on Revelation chapter 11. However, Revelation 10 sets the stage for chapter 11, and we can't fully understand the prophecy without this context. Chapter 10 begins, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. We should first establish that these symbols don't just have one meaning. We need to consider that there is a real mighty angel in heaven, but also that this represents manifestations of themes on the earth. When read in context, chapter 9 mentions six angels before this one, and later John refers to him as the seventh angel. Continuing on to verse 3, this angel cries out or shouts like a lion, depending on the translation. And when it does, all seven angels or thunders sound off, as if this angel is chief among them. A scholarly background would tell you that the number seven in Hebrew symbolizes the seventh day, or the Sabbath, Shabbat. You may also know that the seventh planet, Saturn, is called Shabbatai in Hebrew. Saturn's themes are central to the prophecy of the two witnesses and the mighty angel. The word angel can also be translated as messenger, connecting the theme of the mighty messenger sent to earth from above. In verse 1, we read that this mighty messenger has a rainbow upon his head. Reflecting on nature, a rainbow has seven rays or angles of light. Once again, the number seven appears, hinting at a Saturnian connection. Furthermore, the messenger's face is described as being like the sun. The sun symbolizes the power of God made manifest, and the face or head refers to the head of the cosmos, which is the Lamb of God, represented in the heavens by the constellation Aries. This could suggest an alignment in the heavens, but even if not, it certainly signifies that this messenger is imbued with power from the Lamb of God. We should seriously consider using the stars and planetary bodies to understand these prophecies, as John heavily relies on these symbols in his vision. Yet this messenger comes in the cloud, once again reflecting the symbolism found in nature. A cloud mitigates the light of the sun and can even hide it. There is clearly something veiled from the majority of the world happening here. Lastly, in the first verse of chapter 10, the messenger's feet are described as pillars of fire. In the cosmos, the feet of the heavens are symbolized by the constellation Pisces. Interestingly, many fish are shaped like feet, and if you observe Pisces, one fish appears to be breaking free, as if ascending to the heavens. This symbolizes the connection between the feet and the heavens. When a messenger comes with feet of fire, he brings the fire of the heavens with him. Fire representing God, power, passion, enlightenment, and the ability to destroy the wicked. Verse 5 and 6 describe this messenger differently from others, focusing on his descent to earth, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, that there should be time no longer. Once again, the scripture references something cosmic. The messenger points upward to the heavens, toward the light in the sky, declaring that time is no longer, as if the cosmos reflects his declaration. We should definitely be paying more attention to the heavens. Also, notice where the messenger stands. 
on the sea, and on the earth. These elements represent two of the four cardinal points or seasons of the earth, namely water and earth. The other unnamed elements are fire and air. What's important to understand is that John the Baptist, who carried the theme of water, was born around the fall equinox, during the season of Libra, the scales of balance. Jesus, on the other hand, was born under the sign of Aries, the Lamb of God, which begins at the spring equinox, symbolizing the element of air, or the breath of life. Remember when John the Baptist said of Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease? This parallels with their birth signs. Libra, John's sign, is the time of year when light decreases and darkness grows, while Aries, Jesus' sign, marks the increase of light, overcoming the darkness. John's statement was not only symbolic, but literally shown in nature by their birth times. Before John's prophecy, the foundational prophetic teachings came from individuals born under the sign of water and air. Looking at our present situation, this implies two foundational prophets who must precede the final prophet, and it gives us clues about their birth signs. One will be born under Libra, like John the Baptist, but another, connected to the element of Earth, will be born under the sign of Capricorn, the goat. <coughs> there are numerous other scriptures that touch on this subject, including rituals where a scapegoat is burdened and blamed with the sins of others. A figure more likely perceived as an antichrist to the world instead of a real bona fide prophet per prophecy. This is a separate topic worth studying, but for now, it suffices to say that these prophets are likely tied to the signs described in Revelation chapter 12, which have already come to pass. It's a subject well worth your exploration. So many ask, who are these two witnesses that are to come? Many speculate it could be Moses, Enoch, Elijah, or a combination of holy prophets from the past. Yet let's turn to chapter 11, the official chapter of the two witnesses, where some intriguing language may give us clues. In verse 1, the word rod is used, and in verse 4, the two witnesses are called olive trees, which seems reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, where it is prophesied, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow forth out of his roots. We should consider that trees often symbolize family lineage. From a Christian perspective, given the nature of trees, it's not a stretch to declare that the stem of Jesse, which is the main body of the tree, is a clear reference to Jesus Christ, who is at the core of everything. If we follow this allegory, the rod comes out of the stem, Jesus. Thus, this could be a biblical reference to Jesus having descendants. And these special prophets, the two witnesses, are likely descendants of the Lord Jesus himself. No wonder why they are able to manifest so much power. As it says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. We should delve deeper into their attire. In ancient times, when this prophecy was given, sackcloth was generally black in color. Therefore, a more likely interpretation is that the two witnesses will be dressed in black. What does this signify? An expert in ancient Jewish customs might point out that black is the color of mourning, and we wouldn't dispute that. However, we should also consider the symbolism of colors in nature and the seasons. In spring, trees blossom and turn white. In summer, they are green. In fall, they turn red. And in winter, they lose their leaves and color as the sun dips lower on the horizon, and the black of night takes over more of the day. Thus, the symbol of black can represent winter, death, curses, and punishment as well as the overarching cycle of life and renewal. This interpretation matches well what is said next in verse 5 and 6. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies, 
and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. These verses vividly depict the divine power manifested through these two prophetic figures. Their mission, however, is specific, to punish the wicked. They are, in essence, destroying angels, wielding the power of fire, consuming their enemies, and inflicting plagues. As prophesied, Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, with healing in his wings, was foreshadowed by the heavenly signs at his birth. These signs that likely provided clues that guided the wise men to his location and identification. Similarly, our individual birth charts, or stars, reveal our unique qualities and potential. These two prophets' birth charts likely contain specific indicators, such as the power to shut the heavens, signifying their destructive mission. We are witnessing a reoccurring theme, the connection between the seventh angel, Saturn, and Capricorn. Saturn, often called the Black Sun, rules Capricorn, the sign associated with winter, the darkest time of year. The sackcloth worn by the two witnesses has a connection to goat hair, because that was the material commonly used in ancient times to craft sackcloth from. This connection to goat hair further ties the witnesses to Capricorn, the goat constellation. To fully grasp the themes presented here, we must delve into the realm of cosmology. A deeper understanding of the cosmos and nature is essential to avoid getting lost in the complexities of these symbolic representations. So what do we need to know to understand the themes of Capricorn? What's the message for us that God wants us to understand? For one, Capricorn is the father of the zodiac. The central question of this prophecy is the identity of the father. Is it Satan, the god of this world, or Jesus, who has redeemed the earth? This question underscores the ongoing cosmic battle, which, as Revelation chapter 12 suggests, has spilled over from heaven onto earth, Team Michael versus Team Dragon, as they war for our souls. Even the number 1,260 are mentioned in the chapter, which represent the days of their ministry, should also be considered symbolically. Let's break them down. The number 1,000, as Peter suggests, represents a day to the Lord. The number 200, in its earliest Hebrew form, was a depiction for a head. The number 60 was the symbol of the thorn in the earliest form of Hebrew, and it represented Capricorn. The numbers 1,260 altogether could mean the day of the head father. Once again, this fatherly Capricorn theme is central to the message being presented. For the father carries the theme of reprimand and punishment, which is present in this prophecy. Continuing on to verse 7 and 8, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. When viewed through a cosmic lens, these verses align with the season of Capricorn, the sign of the goat, the winter solstice, when the sun reaches its lowest point, is often symbolized as the beast of the bottomless pit and the black tomb of the sun. The prophecy of the two witnesses rising from death after three and a half days parallels the sun's apparent pause and subsequent return to life, symbolizing rebirth and resurrection. This is reminiscent of Christmas, as Christmas Eve or early Christmas morning occurs approximately three and a half days after the winter solstice, when the sun begins its ascent in the sky. Yet the two witnesses in this prophecy were so hated that the people celebrated their defeat by exchanging gifts. This parallels the practice of gift-giving at Christmas, which also has connection to the story of Jesus, who died for approximately three days before his resurrection. Yet the two witnesses in this prophecy were so hated that their enemies refused to allow them to be buried. This unique detail distinguishes their story from that of Jesus, who was placed in a tomb. There may be further nuances to this story. 
as John seems to reference them later in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. It seems that from this and other scripture, that the two witnesses were not left in one piece to ensure their complete destruction. Perhaps this is why they aren't able to be buried. This suggests the extreme fear and hatred the two witnesses will invoke because of their abilities, akin to the power God bestowed upon the legendary Samson. Samson's strength came from keeping only a part of the Nazarite vow for a time. If these witnesses were to take the same vow, but uphold it in its entirety, wouldn't their power be even greater? The Nazarite vow, also known as the Law of Separation, involves sacrifices at its conclusion, where the animals are cut into many pieces, potentially foreshadowing the fate awaiting these two prophets. Also note that John connects the theme of the Mark of the Beast with these two witnesses. If the beast of the bottomless pit represents death, hell, and the grave, as it represents that for the Son, the fact that the witnesses do not receive a grave aligns with their overcoming of these forces. They do not remain dead, nor descend into hell, but rise again as the Son does when it comes to the constellation of this beast. People may look into this great prophecy and marvel at the power to be manifested, but don't lose sight of the theme. Each winter season, the sun does pass this cold, dark beast. But the next sign the sun reaches is Aquarius, which is also known as the sign of the Son of Man, the upcoming cosmic age. Remember the words which the last messenger will say as he points to the sky. There is time no longer.